Good afternoon, people. Welcome to another episode of Eaton House Live. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for tuning in. And as promised, we are here today with another topic, which we know is top of mind for most parents, which is screen time. How much is too much? My name is Bipasha. And before we begin, um, just a couple of uh, reminders and announcements. Uh, so if you like what, we, what you're seeing right now and you want to be updated with the events and the sessions on Eaton House Live, do go on to the upcoming events section and click interested. Um, alternatively, you can also follow us or follow Eaton House International on Facebook. You could also sign up for our newsletters on Eaton House blog and I promise you it's incredible content and it's all things parenting. You can also download our ebook on the digital literacy guide. All the information and the description, uh, all the links are in our description. Um, last but not the least, this session is for you. So let's make it as interactive as possible. Send in all your questions. If you don't have questions, send us a wave or a heart, whatever it is, just tell us that you're watching. Uh, right, so let's dive straight into it. Uh, I have here today Nina. Nina Hi. is the um, uh, co-founder for Bluefish. Bluefish works with schools such as us, as well as organizations on cyber risk and cyber security. And they're working on an educational gap, intending to build um, knowledge and information and uh, training with parents as well as young children to um, address the digital future that we have ahead of us. So most importantly, Nina is a parent and an Eaton House parent at I that. I am indeed, yes. <laughs> So really excited to have Nina here today to share her expertise and knowledge on the topic. Um, so let's get started, Nina. Thank, thank you, you very for, much. Thank you for being here. No worries. Um, before we dive into the questions, uh, perhaps you can tell us a little bit about yourself and about Bluefish. Yep. So uh, Bluefish, we started in 2017 and how it came about, me and my co-founder Shaley Shah really recognised there was a huge issue in cyber risk with children and it wasn't really being addressed and being parents ourselves, um, we also fell into that trap of our children watching YouTube or going on to things without us really understanding where there was a deficiency or there was a risk factor. Mm -hmm. So we started there and the company has grown exponentially in the last year and a half and we now also work with organisations and uh, people on the street, how we need to know about cyber risk, what should we be aware of because we're more likely to face a cyber crime than we ever are uh, at actual crime nowadays. And I don't think we're fully equipped to yeah, keep ourselves yeah. safe. Yeah, and so yeah. that's where Bluefish really stepped in. Brilliant, brilliant. And Nina, of course, works with educators and parents as well. Yeah. Um, so, you know, uh, I know, I mean, digital devices are pretty much ubiquitous. They are a part of our lives. But fortunately or unfortunately for us, when we were growing up as parents, we had yeah. no access to digital devices. <laughs> so there is no reference point. There's nothing that we can access in terms of what our parents worked with in yeah. terms of parenting skills around digital devices. And recently there was a research and a bit scary because it said kindergartners, um, those uh, accessing screens for over two hours a day are at risk at, of behavioral problems, or attention problems mm. and preteens and teens um, you know, ones who access screen time far too often than they should, uh, it reflects in their academic results, their grades, their yeah. aptitude, etc. So how far do you, you know, agree to that? And does that, does that number that's quoted in the research, does that change with age as, as the children get older? Yeah, absolutely. I think screen time, um, it's a really complex topic. So when we talk about screen time, it goes back to the days when we were talking about television. And so the rules haven't really changed. When I was younger, you know, people would say two hours of TV is enough. And that, that figure has come over as a hangover. What we have to understand about kids today is what screen are we talking about? I mean, we have the device, we have, you know, watches that kids are wearing. We have the TV, we have the phone, we have the computer at school. So it's really complicated. It's not mm -hmm. as easy as saying two hours is enough. And I think that's one thing we try to stress to parents is sometimes that, 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 that changes. It, it, it has to be fluid. With a toddler, we have seen and we have antidotal cases where language skills have uh, fallen back due to uh, misuse of screen time. And it's really easy to do, to use the screen to manage our parenting. If our child isn't eating, uh, I think most parents have done it where you're like, I'll let them watch something while they're eating. Or if you're on a long journey, expat parents will understand this, 10 hours on a plane and we'll <laughs> pass over a device for as long as possible. Um, so it's really, really complicated. And what we try and preach at Bluefish is there's positive screen time and there's negative screen time. It's not as easy as saying two hours of screen time to a teenager because that two hours could have been done 
in class. Right. And actually, technology today is part of their DNA. So if you're going to say, well, your two hours is done, um, you could be having a lot of social peer pressure yeah. for you to be on something later in the evening. And if you're not there, it can affect you in many different ways. So it, it's complicated and every parent will decide their screen time differently. Right. Um, what about children below the age of two? There's research that says no screen time at all. Uh, is that is that a validated research or is that something that people just so say? Is, does it I think the most yeah. important thing to point out is biologically there's no proof that screen time will affect your child. Now mentally and mental health it can affect your child. One of the big reasons we say under the age of a year don't give your child screen time is because they should be doing things that are more interactive, right. uh, working with their motor skills more, engaging with humans one to one. Right. Um, Again, as parents, we know screen time is invaluable as expats as well because that's how you speak to granny, that's how you speak yeah, to uncle yeah. and auntie. Yeah. And that type of interaction is there. But there is no actual benefit to the child being on the screen younger than 15 months old. Right. We don't actually see that they learn quicker or faster. Right. They may be more engaged in that app right. than you know, the toy, yeah. but they will still only have a three to five minute mm -hmm. attention span with yeah. each, yeah. unless you're putting them in front of passive content. Right. Passive content is when I put my son in front of Paw Patrol because I'm trying to do something, yeah. and yeah. I know he will sit there, mm -hmm. but he's getting nothing from that. Yeah. So yeah. it's being aware as a parent what you're doing, we do it, but be aware that cognitive thinking online and passive thinking online are two different things. Right, right. What about physical repercussions? You know, uh, you started, what, two years of age, you start accessing screens. Um, in the past, you know, the television was a bigger screen, you're sitting comfortable yeah. on a couch and accessing that content, but now with smaller screens and, and, and the fact that we don't Usually the, the research says you need to look away every 15 minutes, yeah. but we don't do that. So by the time a child reaches 14 or 15 years of age, um, he's literally what watched an hour, a year long TV, you know, yeah. of, of uh, hours of d uh, digital screen time is what he's done. So what about the physical repercussions in terms of eyesight, in terms of posture and right. those sorts of so things? So in terms of, um, uh, as I said, biologically, there is no investigation that have gone further enough to say this this would happen and yeah. I remember again when I was younger it'd be like if you sit too close to the TV yeah, you yeah. Four yeah, eyes. Yeah. so a lot of it can be mythical right and I think that what we need to worry about parent as parents with our children in front of the screen is anxiety mm -hmm. uh, being in front of the screen for that long and being torn away from it if you ever take a screen away from your child that snap uh, uh, I'm meltdown yeah. yeah the meltdown that you have at two years old and you have at 15 years yeah. old of oh I was in the middle of something I was in the middle of the game of Fortnite. I'm letting my friends down right that's where uh, we need to be having a conversation mm -hmm. and understanding why are you so attached to it yeah can you disengage with yeah. it I would be much more worried about that than physical and again posture there's many reasons why teenage posture uh, <laughs> sort of shifts itself yeah. I wouldn't blame it on the screen so much um, but the social pressure the pressure to be online, the pressure to be part of conversations which you may not be comfortable with, this is where we need to be having discussions. Right, right. So obviously uh, what I'm hearing from you is it's important to manage screen time and to make it um, an experience which is positive and you know is sustainable yeah. and all of that. So can you share some practical tips uh, that parents could actually start to you know actually um, integrate within their lives in, in their family time or you know with their devices and how they use it at home etc. Yeah. So uh, the rule really goes, and uh, you know the rule is quite annoying, is in monkey see, monkey do. If you are doing it, your children will do yeah. it. So have a cyber pledge at home of, we won't be bringing our screens to the dinner table. We will leave our phones downstairs um, and switch off at a certain time. There will be uh, a power down time, where we power down and we have conversations. Um, children who enjoy being online or love gaming, um, there is nothing negative to that, as long as you have the parent controls on but make sure they have the equal amount of time with real people outside of the screen um, that they have an engaging uh, relationships away from technology the worry is when the whole of their social life shifts to technology and we're talking about teenagers here and you don't have that shift in the real world as well that's when we need to question are mm -hmm. they spending too much time mm -hmm. with that screen mm -hmm. so have pledges that will help you out um, also there are tools out there one of them that we love to recommend for teenagers parents of teenagers 
is Bark. It's an app that will bark at you if things are said on social media or online that you should worry about, which means you can give your child privacy of being in their own domain and you will only be alerted when something goes wrong. But it's integral you have a conversation with your child and saying, I'm putting this app on because I'm looking after your well-being. If you switch it off, and every child will learn how to switch it off. So if you switch it off, then you know the device will be taken away from yeah, you. Yeah. So you have to make children aware that we are here to support you and yeah. your screen time. Yeah. Um, I find that if we go the route of you can't have a screen, you're not allowed to use it, you're not allowing your child to be in today's technical world, which right. means you know, my children do their homework on. Uh, with Eaton House, we do a lot of apps and things like that, and they absolutely adore it. Now, for me not to register to do that, and they're not on the leaderboard with their friends, right. it does affect them. Yeah, yeah. Oh, well, um, I think with teenagers, it's a different kettle of fish, isn't it? Um, because you want to give them the autonomy. You're talking about how they should be independent yeah. and responsible with their time, but at the same time, you're in including these restrictions in terms of how they access their screens for how long yeah. and you're putting in a nanny or perhaps even a GPS tracker. It's a very fine balance, isn't it? Um, and I, I often, you know, being the mom of a teenager, um, the, sometimes the conversations are, but then so-and-so's family allows yeah. it and so-and-so. So those are, <laughs> I, I don't know, I know there's no right or wrong yeah. answer. And then parenting is really um, something that's integral to you, isn't it? Um, there's, Absolutely. There's no right or wrong parenting, yeah. but that becomes a problem, doesn't it? It does. And um, it's. I think that's the biggest one is the pressure of my friend is doing this, my friend is on Fortnite, my friend has a phone already. Um, and I think that's been through generations of, yeah. you know, I want what the other person has. But you have, to, at the end of the day, there is no one controlling the internet. Right. There is no one controlling cyberspace for your children. Yeah. They can click, 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 and AI and uh, other machine learning will take them to places that you would not want them to go. Yeah. So you are fundamentally in charge of that, and it's up to you as a parent how in charge of that you want to be. Right. Your child might not like you for it if you are uh, a military-style parent yeah. and you want to be very heavy on it, right. but you're doing it through concern. And also, each child is different. Like, I know one of my children will be very aware of her parameters herself, the other one will continue yeah. down a deep yeah. hole and not notice she's got there. Yeah. So um, I think that, that makes a big difference. Right, right. Uh, talking about, you mentioned um, Fortnite, and uh, so what are the uh, platforms, the social platforms that children are accessing today? And uh, are there age restrictions? Um, and, and what should parents know? So, I mean, we, we're aware of Instagram and Snapchat and Facebook, yeah. but those are not the platforms that teenagers or even preteens are accessing these yes. days. So w w what are the... So in Singapore, um, the uh, prevalent ones that we see are Fortnite, Roblox, Minecraft, um, Instagram, Snapchat, TikTok. None of these apps have been built to harm children. Mm -hmm. That is the one fundamental thing. Mm -hmm. um, but they do have features that you should be aware of as parents. Uh, one is the ability, like Fortnite, to speak to strangers. And when we go in to schools, we find that a lot of 12-year-olds uh, upwards have all spoken to a stranger online. So that's something to be aware of. It's interesting, isn't it, that when they meet a stranger offline in the real world, it's a stranger, but online they become online friends. For some yeah. reason, they don't. They are not considered, uh, you know, someone that might harm them. It, it seems to be a different world, a parallel world that's that's running alongside yes. for our children. And I think a lot of children don't understand just because that person says they're a sixteen-year-old. Um, who's a friend of a friend, that they might not be a 16-year-old. Right, right. um, and then it comes to a certain age where they do become aware of that, and it is a case of then making sure those parental controls are there and that you still have an ability to discuss with your child what they've seen and make sure that you've educated them how to report because there'll be a stage where they won't want to report it to you mm -hmm. but you can tell them you know you are part of a larger digital citizenship and you should be reporting it for the sake of other children right, as well yeah. and that's one way of getting them to take control right so um you know these different roblox and minecraft and all of that parents tend to see them as educational applications yeah. um, but there are risks there are, there are strangers yeah. and all. so what are some of the safety features that these platforms have that you think parents should know okay so um, with um, uh, Minecraft they do have strong 
uh, parental blocks that you can make sure strangers cannot speak to them. The biggest problem with Minecraft they've, we've had in the past is when hackers come in and change the wallpaper mm -hmm. into porn or change it into something that a child should not be seeing. Right. So it's more of an external hack. With Fortnite, the problem that we have is um, the fact that it's so child-friendly in its aesthetic and its look, children get very comfortable speaking to strangers yeah, there, yeah. but they might not know who they are. You can go into the parent settings and switch off the microphone and the chat settings, and you can also make sure your children only play with their friends. Mm -hmm. So that that's a, a key one. The other one that we see with Fortnite that becomes an issue is if they leave the game early, they can get in trouble with their friends who mm -hmm. they were playing a 20-minute game with. Yeah. So being aware of as well of them and what it's like to be a teenager, right. that you know you time set towards those 20 minutes as well. Okay. Okay. Um, and uh, what about video games? Is there an appropriate age for video games? Oh, just just a minute. I think there was a question that yes. I had with regard to the minimum age for you know apps and even WhatsApp for that matter. What is the minimum age? So for all apps and for social media apps, if it isn't written, it's 13 years of age. Yeah. A child not, should not have a social media account or anything before the age of 13. By any of the privacy terms and conditions, it's not allowed. That includes Gmail. Um, if they have an email address, it should be a school email address where it, they can be carefully monitored. Um, in terms of the question about age and apps, uh, there are two ratings. The rating in Singapore is quite simple. You go onto the app store and it will say this is for four and mm -hmm. under, this is for 13 and under. Yeah. If you are on an Amer American store or an Android store, it will be TMA, so T is teenager, A is adult, okay. so you can go by those standards. What we do in my house is if my daughters want an app, we go to Common Sense Media, where they will give us a rating as a parent and a rating as a child, and we'll read it together, so they understand whether they're allowed it or not, mm -hmm. so they can understand, right, this this is for nine and above, and you're too young for it, so you're not allowed it. But one of the best resources out there is Common Sense Media for parents and teachers. Mm -hmm. uh, we use it a lot. Yeah, yeah, brilliant. Common Sense Media, that is, and yeah. for all of us as parents. Um, uh, the other question I had was with regard to YouTube um, and content around mm. YouTube. And I think we talked about it earlier, how one thing leads to the other and can kind of completely go downhill from yes. starting off with Peppa Pig, but eventually... <laughs> Yeah, you end up in you're, a yeah. You're home. taught you're taught how to self harm. So, how do you control that? And um, do, what what do you has YouTube kind of got more mature with the kind of parental controls they have in place? And how does that work? YouTube has been very honest in the fact that it's very very complicated to control YouTube. It is um, updated in real time, um, and so it's very hard for YouTube to be able to do that control. Um, they did have a setting where you could watch uh, content that had only been watched by a human, but that has been switched off now, mm -hmm. um, unless it's changed lately, but recently it was switched off. For me, um, what I would suggest is, if the child is very young, try to stay off YouTube. There is um, other things like Netflix that make sure that the AI is controlled for your yeah, child. Yeah. If you do want to go to YouTube and use it, um, either be there and be present, which is not always mm -hmm. possible, or go find a, a subscription channel. So go to the BBC or go to Nickelodeon and subscribe to their list of content. So okay. they follow that chain. Okay. The other one is if they want to watch YouTube, watch it on a smart TV. Right. Because you can't click off into yeah. different corners. Um, YouTube has a role. It's fabulous. I use it a lot. But no one is regulating it. So the content you end up with, like you can start watching these unwrapping videos mm -hmm. or uh, Play-Doh videos for hours and hours, and then you have to question what, what are they actually getting out of it? Yeah. Are they getting something yeah. from it? Uh, one of the questions that has come in is that, you know, uh, we as adults are always accessing our phones. It's always next to our, our bedside table. That's how we set our alarms. That's the last thing we look at before going to bed. And yet we expect children. Yeah. Uh, to behave differently, but the expectations of the modern working environment is that you have to be always on. on yeah. So um, it, I, I know it's a tough question, but <laughs> is there a way to get around this or circumvent that there are different, you know, rules for different people? Yeah. I, again, it's monkey see, monkey do. Um, if your child sees that you're on WhatsApp and you're, you know, being negative about someone, it's more likely that they will then pick up WhatsApp and do the same. Uh, 
there is now lots of tools out there for you to monitor your screen time but me myself ended up switching it off because I just realized I was on it too long yeah um, but that cyber pledge uh, pledge it with your children I've been to uh, parents houses where they have it on the door or on the fridge of these are the rules and let your children also tell you these are the rules um, we have a distinct rule that if we go to a restaurant and I'm paying for a meal, you will not be on a device. Mm -hmm. um, and if we're sitting down together, the device is gone. So you then have to remember that yourself. And I'm one for grabbing my husband's phone and being like, no, 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 it's not device time. It's tough. It's tough in yeah. every house um, because technology is so persuasive. Yeah. And it's persuasive to us. So imagine what it's, it's like to our children. To young children. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, what about um, video games? We touched upon yes. that. So how does, how, you know, where, where do you go with that? So being in technology, video games are integrally important to people who really connect with them. Mm -hmm. uh, lots of research has been done for children who are introverted, who don't, uh, norm, you know, don't work so well in a social setting, find a world and a comfort zone in the world of video games. Mm -hmm. um, so let's not write them off. Again, if you find that they are spending an excessive amount of time, if your child can't tell you how long they were on that video game for, mm -hmm. then there is a problem. Mm -hmm. Make sure that the video game is of their age and that they can't access and speak to strangers um, readily. Um, a lot of times there will be chats in the corner. Sometimes those chats will have language that you will not feel appropriate for your mm -hmm. child. Or there may be memes that are being shared that will expose your children to stuff that you weren't wanting to expose them to. So sit down, play the game with them, watch them, be yeah, aware of it to I think start that's with. that's very important, yeah. isn't it? To really experience the game yourself. Yeah, yeah. but like most technology, um, I would say there is a positive play to it if it's used well. Um, and video gaming is the start of sometimes a real interest in technology as well. Mm -hmm. um, so does Common Sense Media also have some information on the kind of video games or the content correct. of it that is useful and what is not or age appropriate? Yes, yes. So um, one of the reasons Fortnite does so well is because if, even though it is uh, you know, one person killing a hundred people is done in a non-graphic while way while Grand Theft Auto is something you wouldn't want a child to be playing on at a certain age. So you can go to Common Sense Media and you can check out um, everything about the video game. You can actually do it with films as well if you're wondering will my child be scared of Aladdin, you can go and have a look and it okay. will, will tell you a parent's point of view of the film. Okay, and what do you, um, uh, what do you think of, you know, training or, s uh, you know, certain sessions that parents should um, start to access with their children together like towards that journey of you know creating that pledge and as a family investing in something which you believe is sustainable and the good you know for the good of the family uh, but you know how do you do you recommend parents do that and where do you find these courses um, and uh, at what age do you think they should yeah. begin so we actually with Eaton House also have come in and we've done workshops with your children at the age of five mm -hmm. um, because they are on platforms at that age and we do a superhero program where we come in and say, you know, make sure you have a, an identity online which is different to your identity offline and mm -hmm. make sure cyber baddies, you know how to find them and report them. Um, Bluefish has uh, learning modules on our site to do that and uh, if you go through um, Common Sense Media or a few other channels, you will find engaging content. Where we believe we should be having conversations with our children is about their digital footprint, right. being a good digital citizen. Um, unfortunately, in a world like today, fake news, critical thinking, just because something's coming to you and it says it's true does not mean it's yeah, true. Yeah. Um, so those are clear areas. And cyberbullying as well is another one that we address um, and, and have conversations about. Okay, brilliant. Um, so I had a question on, uh, yeah, well now that we're talking about cyberbullying, um, there are different rules in different jurisdictions around cyberbullying. Yeah. Um, what's the context like in Singapore and how, because I mean, this is something that I was reading somewhere that in Australia, you know, a WhatsApp group uh, turned into, it started off with a, a play date, uh, managing a, like a, I think it was a, not a play date, but it was managing a, a school assignment and suddenly it went downhill from there and there was a lot of bullying, a lot yeah. of exclusion, and um, all the participants of that group were um, yeah, incriminated to some extent. So what are the rules in Singapore, and uh, how should we as adults as well as, as parents 
be aware and where should we go to in yeah. terms of accessing that information? So cyberbullying is a huge problem in Singapore um, and as of now I personally don't know of any rules that would intervene with cyberbullying um, but obviously the same laws that apply if you're being aggressive or hostile to somebody in the technical world you will have the same repercussions in, in, the, in the world itself. Um, to understand cyberbullying um, and uh, what you should do in disciplinary way, I always say revert to your school and your school's policies because they know what to do. Don't try fighting it yourselves or contacting the parents directly or using technology to expose the cyberbullying because it just goes wrong. And what I've found when you're talking to teenagers about cyberbullying, who are the cyberbullies, they don't really know that they got to that position. It right. sort of escalates so fast because of the team sort of spirit of cyberbullying. While cyberbullying when we were younger was maybe one or two people against one person. Cyberbullying is now, you're in a WhatsApp group, you think it's funny, and then you post it, and then you get like everyone around you thinking it's funny too. So those people around it are also the cyberbullies. Yeah. And sometimes they just don't realize they've got them. Right. One of the great tools that we always recommend is an app called Rethink. It is a free app uh, uh, which was created by a young lady who got really annoyed that the victim always gets told switch off the phone and you know you deal with it and the bully doesn't have to deal with it at all and the app just sends a quick reminder every time a, a teen or a preteen sends a message saying will this cause emotional harm and what we find is if you sort of parent with just that one line they will think before they post okay. and so it's a great app to have on any teen preteen's phone mm, interesting Interesting. Uh, so we, we're running out of time. So is there anything that you want to add, Nina? Just like a final, some final thoughts to parents? Um, um, I think, it, you know, to, to really understand that technology is part of the DNA, uh, more research has shown that while we at our age will see our online presence and our presence as two separate things, children today see them both as both things. So for them to understand everything online is permanent, is really integral and important. The mistakes that we made, unfortunately for us, are not documented, <laughs> but the mistakes they will make will be documented. Um, so to really take seriously that technology is part of their DNA, is part of their life, and we need to help them navigate it. It's not a case of you know, enforcing rules, it's about supporting them. Brilliant. Do we have another question? Okay, there's another one coming up. Well, we will be um, condensing all this information and put it into an amazing blog, and which will be available at Eaton House, at the Eaton House blog. So do uh, sign up for our uh, newsletters there. Um, we will also have this information of this entire conversation on uh, Facebook as well. So, right. How do you ask your child to share their online experiences with us parents? Because um, we don't get it. Uh, well, you can ask them, and as, as I remember being a teenager, you probably won't get all of it. Depends again what type of parent you want to be. You can install something like Nanny Net that will track it a bit more. Uh, there's also Bark. Um, again, that is the, the conversation we'll all have. How do you get your teenager or your preteen teen to tell you? Um, I mean, uh, it's a case of being up to date. One thing we touched upon um, was that most children now of the age of 13, 14 have a Finster account, mm -hmm. um, <laughs> which uh, most parents don't know it's what it is. First time I'm hearing yeah. of it, oh my goodness. Yeah. So ask your children, you know, come up with, a, uh, Google the terms, see what the new terms are, see if they know what they are, and you'll see the light in their eyes if they recognize what these things are or not. Um, wow. And keep the dialogue going, even if you have to do it in second person, like have you heard of a right. friend who's had right. a Finster right. account? Okay. And just so you know what a Finster account is, it is the alter ego account of a child on Instagram. So there'll be the account you know about, and then there'll be the account you don't know about. It's dangerous, isn't it? And how creative are they? Yes. Um, one particular app I find partic uh, you know, very useful um, is Moments. Um, so basically, yes. uh, it's something that we've downloaded as a family, and then we do a bit of a reflection, a reflective thinking at the end of the week. Oh, Look at how lovely. often, yeah, yeah, how often we've accessed a particular a particular app or just screen time in general and uh, talk about it. So I think that's something that uh, unconsciously, as, as, a, as an adult as well, when I look at moments and I look at my graph, I'm yeah. like shocked sometimes. So it's something that um, one should look at in terms of a more sustainable practice for the family towards cyber Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. And if you, um, 
if you again go to common sense, I'm really selling common sense media here, but you go and they will have a list of apps that will help you support your parenting on, on the device. Brilliant. So we need to bookmark that. Yes, yeah, absolutely. Um, so thank you so much, Nina. I think we are all a lot smarter, a lot more knowledgeable, a lot more in tune with the youngsters. Thank you. <laughs> uh, and for that amazing information, that wealth of information. Thank you for being an Eaton House parent. Oh. And uh, if you have any questions for us, feel free to send them through uh, Facebook. And like I said, you will have all this information on the blog as well as download our digital literacy guide where we actually have a lot of information from Bluefish as well. Yes. Um, so till then, uh, till we have the next Eden House Live, uh, have a lovely weekend, have a lovely summer, and uh, I'll see you when I see you. Thank you. Bye-bye.